As we peer into the depths of space, we are met by the gaze of cold realization. Humans seem to be completely and utterly alone. Despite a seemingly high likelihood of finding someone out there, the deafening silence proves to be impossible to ignore. Maybe this has been engineered. Imagine a zoo so perfect in its construction that the animals remain completely unaware of their captivity, observed by invisible zookeepers with thoughts and motivations beyond their comprehension. Would the animals eventually be let free? Could they find a way to break out on their own? Or are they doomed to a lonely existence, never able to peek behind the curtain before their end? This is the Zoo Hypothesis. Good evening, I am your host, Adrian Maddox. Together, we will journey across the cosmos and search for some of the answers to humanity's most important questions. So grab a drink and welcome to the bar at the edge of the universe. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to the bar at the edge of the universe. Tonight's episode is a continuation of our previous episode, The Great Silence. So if you have not listened to that yet, I highly recommend listening to it first. Um, because we are going to be discussing a answer to the Great Silence or the Fermi's Paradox. And for the people that need a refresher, or maybe you don't want to listen to the first episode, the Fermi's Paradox is the contradiction between a seemingly high statistical likelihood for alien life and apparent lack of any evidence. So as we look into outer space, we notice that <laughs> that there's nothing to notice. <laughs> there are there appear to be no aliens. We have no evidence whatsoever of any form of alien life at all. And this is very weird. And over the years, there have been many proposed answers to this Fermi paradox. And tonight we are going to be discussing just one called the zoo hypothesis. Now, these uh, these proposed answers, they fall into three different categories. Category number one is aliens are here or, the, or aliens are aware of us but have chosen to remain a secret. Category two is aliens exist but they have yet to be found. Category three is that humans are alone. So any answer to the Fermi's Paradox or the Great Silence, you can divide into one of these three categories. And the zoo hypothesis falls into the first category. The aliens are here, but they've chosen to remain a secret for whatever reason. Um, and this category is by far the most popular. So let's look at what else we have. Humans are alone. Well, that category is kind of boring <laughs> and uh eventually we will be discussing it on episode and i am kind of like saving it for last because um uh, i'm not so much saving it for last but kind of putting it off because there's like i don't know it's not it's not exciting right like okay we're alone great <laughs> not super interesting uh but you have then you have the second category which is that humans exist or aliens exist and they're somewhere out there they're yet to be found. That's a little bit more exciting, right? So we're not alone and we still have a sense, there's still a sense of discovery. We can still find something out there. We have something to to look uh, look forward to. Like so many possibilities, right? A little bit more exciting, quite a bit more exciting than, the, than, uh, than we're alone. Now, the very first category, aliens are already here. I mean, Come on. Yeah, of course, that's going to be the most popular. That's the most exciting because inside of that category, you have things like the zoo hypothesis. OK, cool. You have UFOs, alien abductions, government conspiracies like that. Like that's some crazy stuff to think about. It's super fun to think about. It's exciting. And uh, yeah, I think uh, I read somewhere that. Uh, what's that? Like Forty-five to fifty percent of people believe that UFOs exist, uh, in the sense that UFOs are alien aircraft, and that number, I supposedly, has been going up each year. So you you can tell that this is a pretty popular idea, 
and let's look at the success of alien movies like alien invasion movies or like any sci-fi movies with aliens um you can see that that like this is just really cool to think about uh unfortunately some would argue that this category is the least scientific in a sense because a lot of the answers in this category such as uh, like for example the zoo hypothesis it honestly it's it could be considered untestable as we'll see later as we discuss it more and get into the nitty-gritty of the details um but i mean you know we're trying, to, we're trying to have some fun here, and I think uh, in the pursuit of knowledge and just trying to learn, we don't we don't discredit anything. We keep an open mind, and you'll be surprised to learn that there are actual legitimate studies to this day regarding this topic and this sub these subjects, especially like the zoo hypothesis. These are taken seriously in the sense that there are papers being published in reputable scientific journals, um, which is cool. So. Even though this section or this category is kind of got to be careful, but it, you know, it's, it's still definitely a 100% worth looking into in my opinion. And it's super fun to look into, which is why I really wanted to talk to you guys about it. So the zoo hypothesis, let's talk about its, uh, let's talk about its origins. Okay. The zoo hypothesis was first proposed by John Ball in 1973. Now, John Ball submitted this paper to, I believe it, I don't know how to pronounce this. <laughs> you guys are going to be mad. Uh, Icarus? 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 I think it's Icarus. It's a scientific journal, I believe, on planetary science. And uh, so, yeah, he submitted it in 1973. And this is where he first outlined the idea of the zoo hypothesis. Before this, no one had thought of it. So this is kind of cool, right? Uh, and the the interesting thing is, so I read this entire paper, um, and it's like a three-page paper. <laughs> the other papers that I've been looking at were like 13 pages with all sorts of data. And believe me, it was like, when I read papers like that, there's so much like technical information that it's really hard to follow for someone like me that doesn't like have any training or uh, like any education really to to understand the uh like all the data and like all the terms that they're using so i'm constantly having to google stuff but uh this was such a relief because honestly this paper he just talks about his idea i think there's like one figure in the entire paper and there's like no like no data really at all it's just him spitballing his idea so it's not even really that scientific <laughs> and uh it Hey, I liked it. I thought it was the best paper that I'd read. Like, it was actually fun <laughs> to read, which is surprising. Normally, I'm like, oh, my God. I'm just kind of trying to find stuff that I can understand. <laughs> I don't know about you guys. Maybe y'all are smarter than me. But um, in the beginning of his paper, he uh, talks about the zoo hypothesis. And before we describe exactly what it is, he said that there are three crucial hypotheses, hy hypotheses, Hypoth hypothesis, I don't know. Someone let me know in the comments what, what the pl plural hypothesis is. <laughs> the three crucial, um, yes, that need to be true for the zoo hypothesis to be true. Uh, the first one is whenever the conditions are such that life can exist and evolve, it will. Okay, so that has to be true. Number two, there are many places where life can exist. Number three, we are unaware of them by them. Uh, suppose he means aliens. He then states that it is statistically unlikely to find alien life in our galaxy whose level of development is comparable to ours. They are either going to be far ahead of us or they're going to be far behind us. And that really makes sense, right? So if you take the point, uh, the, the point that we are in with our tech technological development, it re like, what are the odds is that someone out there is going to be at our, at our exact point or even within a hundred years or even within like 500 years, 
the earth is the earth is billions of years old right 4.5 billion years old the first planet started forming like nine point something billion years ago it's going to be pretty pretty hard for it to like line up perfectly right so we can kind of assume we have got to be careful with our assumptions right but we can kind of assume that any aliens out there are there's going to be a huge gap in the time frames because there's nothing saying that we like we have to like it's all going to be synced up right so we should really only concern ourselves uh, for the zoo hypothesis anyway we should only concern ourselves with aliens that are far ahead of us okay be as you'll see for later reasons we also want to define technological progress and in this paper john ball says that you can define it as an increasing ability to control one's environment. So you look at humans. We are pretty much in complete control of our environment. The only things, I mean, I guess we are still uh, still victims of nature, definitely, uh, as far as like natural disasters, um, earthquakes, tornadoes. We don't have complete control of that stuff yet. I'm sure we will at some point. But... We, we affect every corner of our planet. And that is a sign of our technological progress. And if you continue the trend, we're not only going to affect our planet, then let's say we go to Mars next, we're going to affect Mars, so on and so forth. So the more technologically advanced a civilization becomes, the more their sphere of influence grows from planet to planet to planet. So something... A civilization that's super far ahead of us is going to have a huge influence and ability to control their environment, which is going to span over, I mean, who knows how big of an area, right? It's kind of crazy to think about. And let's all, let's also look at like what we do. So we, we are aware that we affect so much of this earth. So what have we done? We have set aside nature preserves, wildlife sanctuaries, and yes, zoos to uh, protect animals and let animals develop without human interference because you know we all know humans can be destructive when unchecked and we've done these things to you know allow animals to flourish because we understand that we share our planet with other life forms and they are equally as important as us so what john ball did is he took this idea and he applied it to an alien civilization uh, or alien civilizations. These aliens would also understand that, okay, they might be at the top, but humans, these creatures on earth, they're worth, you know, kind of leaving alone. Like perhaps we are in some sort of zoo or some sort of wildlife sanctuary is crazy as that sounds and they don't interfere with us they are completely aware of us but they have chosen not to directly interfere or make their presence known maybe they're monitoring us who knows um and there there are some variations to the zoo hypothesis there are the laboratory uh, there is the laboratory scenario which john ball mentions and he describes it as morbid and grotesque which is funny and i didn't really look too much into the laboratory scenario but from my understanding it's basically uh that the earth is used has yeah like a lab so they i suppose aliens would use it to conduct experiments of sort um i'm not really sure what that would look like like i haven't read any papers about it or it, i haven't dug too much into it but uh it, yeah, John Ball did say that it was a uh, grotesque, which is funny, uh, and he also was not a fan of it either. I mean, obviously, he used a negative, a negative word to to use it to describe it, but he uh, he said that that it wasn't really worth looking into for some reason. Um, now, another variation is the planetarium hypothesis now the planetarium hypothesis i'm a big fan of because it kind of combines um two different uh like hypothetical scenarios kind of combines the zoo hypothesis with the simulation uh simulation theory 
And we're actually going to talk about that later, and it's really cool, and I think it's my favorite one. But this was, I think this was a later edition um, that came, like, long after John Ball talked about this. So this zoo that we supposedly exist in is a perfect zoo. So we are completely unaware of the zookeepers, and we... We look out in the sky, and whatever we see is engineered somehow. Um, not necessarily a simulation, but maybe they they keep their distance in such a way that we are just complete. Like we just seem like we're alone. So that that's pretty cool. I kind of want to talk about the zoo hypothesis in pop culture, and you guys might be interested to hear that it has been discussed in several forms of entertainment. For all my Trekkie fans out there, this might be sounding pretty familiar. In Star Trek, there's this thing called the Prime Directive. And I'm not a huge Star Trek fan myself. I've been trying to get into it more. I do think it's interesting. But uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Trekkies, but the Prime Directive basically is a rule that um, advanced, I guess... Uh, what what are they called like the uh the the starfleet or <laughs> whatever <laughs> they are not allowed to interfere with the um evolution of a species so that's kind of cool that's pretty much like the zoo hypothesis but reverse cuz humans are doing that to other um alien species and i i that kind of like we would do that cuz we do that with creatures on earth so why wouldn't we do that with aliens now, my favorite example, that was probably the most known example, even though I didn't know much about it. <laughs> but my favorite example is from 2001, A Space Odyssey. Now, 2001, A Space Odyssey, Arthur C. Clarke is a science fiction classic, of course. I'm sure plenty of my fans have read this book or at least have seen the movie. I, I don't even know when this movie came out. 70s, 60s? Something like that. It's a really old movie, but it's a really good movie. And honestly, it almost seems like, depending on which one came first, it's almost as if uh, John Ball was inspired by 2001 A Space Odyssey or vice versa, because literally A Space Odyssey is the zoo hypothesis. And I, I definitely want to discuss it a little more. Maybe this will inspire you guys to read the book. So... It's been a couple years since I've read it, but the book opens up from the point of view of a ancestor to humans. It's like a, not a caveman, but maybe a, uh, I don't know what the right term is. I'm not a, I don't really know a whole lot about like evolution and biology, but I guess maybe like a, a homo erectus. Uh, that, well, he didn't really walk around on two feet. He was like an ape, essentially. He was like the like the link between a like what's a, whatever is in between an ape and a man, right? So it was like a super ancient ancestor of humans. Okay, so he had like fur and he pretty much looked like a monkey, but he's more smart. Um, and he's just like living his life. He lives in a cave. He has a a family, I believe. And one day he notices that there is this tall black obelisk outside and they're kind of like scared of it and eventually uh he touches it he puts his hand on this obelisk it's like super smooth and i believe it gives him like some knowledge it like unlocks something in his brain um and uh he realizes that he can use a <laughs> I think he uses like a stick or something and he, he realizes he can use a stick as a weapon and he like kills um, his rival or something like that. But it basically, yeah, it unlocked something in his brain and it set him on a path to, and it set humans on a path to evolve, to develop technology because I mean, that in itself is kind of a question, right? So is violence and war a drive for technological advancement? I don't think there's any argument. Yes. Right. Uh, so that, that's like the first couple chapters. And then it jumps thousand, probably millions of years in the future. And we are now on the moon. Humans have made it to the moon. And 
this guy is visiting he you know flies a shuttle to the moon and uh, he might be a scientist or something like i said it's been a while since i read this but anyway he's 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 on the moon doing some like investigation there's other people there there's like this whole setup a whole like moon colony type of excavation site with scientists and archaeologists and all sorts of stuff and basically they have uncovered an obelisk buried in the moon um, oh, I also should have told you guys that that obelisk like disappeared. The one that was on Earth, it it disappeared. So um, humans never had seen like this obelisk or anything after it interacted with the with the monkeys back in the day. So we find this mysterious obelisk in the moon, and as soon as we unearth it, it starts sending out this signal. Okay, and uh, it clearly is a something that has been constructed or engineered, and it's sending a signal. And eventually a um, ship is assigned to investigate where the signal is going because it could potentially lead us to aliens. And I don't know if I want to talk about spoilers here because it is, I mean, it's a really old book. So now nah, you guys just got to read it. I'm not going to ruin it for you, but it, it does talk about the zoo hypothesis. That obelisk was, I mean, it's pretty obvious it's alien obelisk. That's not a, that's not a spoiler. But that was planted there and it's set in the moon. And as soon as we dig it up, it sent out a signal. So it was like it was waiting for us to get to a technological point, a certain technological point uh, in our evolution before we were like ready to find it or whatever. And then all sorts of twists and turns happen along the way. And there's a, there's like an AI who may or may not be evil depending on your definition of evil or is he just really efficient at what he does. And yeah, it's a, uh, it's a really good book. You guys got to watch or got to read it or, or watch the movie. And that's probably my favorite example of the zoo hypothesis in pop culture. Now I want to get back to some of the research, right? And specifically, I want to talk about this paper. It's published in 2010 and it's titled the temporal dispersion of the emergence of intelligence and inter arrival time analysis. Now, the point of this paper is to discuss the idea that the zoo hypothesis, as great as it is, and as fun to think about as it is, it kind of falls apart if there are more than one alien civilizations out there. Because it would only take one of these civilizations to interact with us. For the zoo hypothesis to fail so the more civilizations that exist you would assume that the likelihood of one of them saying nah we are going to go to earth and do whatever we want th th that would be a pretty high chance pretty high likelihood it, the chances of that would go up as there are as more civilizations grow and are able to do that and this this paper talks about how it's important to think about this but not only is that a problem, but there is a potential solution to this. It proposes that there is likely a elder civilization. Think of the first civilization, the oldest civilization, and they are in control of everyone else. Okay. They are the most powerful and they set the rules that everyone else has to follow. And they're so advanced that you, you have to do it. You don't have a choice, right? So they continue to talk about the, how life has evolved, how long it has taken life to evolve. They say that planets started forming 9.3 billion years ago. On Earth, it took 600 million years for life to emerge. Life could not have emerged earlier than 8.7 billion years ago. According to this, if, if you assume that it's going to follow the exact same path as Earth, right? Now, Earth was formed 4.5 billion years ago, okay? So, there's a 4.8 billion year gap in between planets forming and then the Earth forming. 
So what if we consider a planet that was formed like towards the beginning in that first billion years or first hundred million years or whatever? Think about how far advanced they would be with just a million, like with, with a, oh my God, with a billion year head start, with a multi-billion year, even a million or a thousand years, they'd be like gods essentially, right? And any civilizations that came after that would be just completely inferior to them. And this original civilization might be setting the rules. They might be the ones that have set up these zoos and have said, no, you will not interact with Earth. You will not interact with any of these planets that we deemed are, are nature preserves or for whatever reason, you know, they have kept us isolated. And that's really interesting to think about. Um, I feel like a lot of times in sci-fi, there's like an elder civilization and most of the time they're like gone or extinct and you kind of see like, uh, like remnants of them. Uh, it kind of reminds me of like the game Mass Effect or, you know, something like that. But that, that is completely plausible to me um, because when, when you're born, you, you're born into a set of rules depending on where you're born, right? There are rules that have been made that you have to follow that you had no part in. So like if you're born in America, you got to follow, you got to follow whatever the American laws are. And you didn't have any choice in that. And you don't have, you don't have any power, especially if you think if you're like a kid, you don't have any power to make any sort of change to that whatsoever. You just have to do whatever they tell you to do. And that would be like that. That's exa exactly what they are talking about here. Any other alien civil, any other civilizations could potentially just be like babies con compared to this one that makes all the rules. And you're just, once you get to a certain point, maybe they are like, Hey, okay, you're, you're ready. And they kind of assimilate you. And then they're like, yeah, so these are the rules. You can't do this, this, and this. And you're like, oh, okay. And th they're like, God, so <laughs> you can't do anything. You just got, you just got to go with it. I think this was pretty interesting. And I love that this is legitimate. Like this is a published paper in a respectable journal. Like this is cool that I'm I, like, I'm, I'm always going to say this. It, I'm so envious of these people that get to get, get to think about this stuff and that's their job. Like how awesome is that? Um, now, as cool as that may be, there is a uh, another thing that we have to bring up is how how would they pull this off? Okay, so it's e it's easy to say that oh they're just so advanced that they can do whatever they want. They're like gods. They like it doesn't matter. They can do whatever. Okay, yeah, I guess. But we can definitely we can definitely unpack it and dig a little deeper and you might be surprised to turn out uh, you might be you might be surprised that it turns out that it, this could actually potentially be very possible and you don't have to reach this level of <laughs> of godhood right to be able to do something like this and i want to take it back to one of the um one of the zoo hypothesis uh, alterations or um i guess they would be called like a uh, a, a variation that's a better word for it and i had mentioned the planetarium hypothesis and i had said that this is my like my favorite one the planetarium hypothesis is how they could potentially pull this off i want you to imagine the earth okay around us is some sort of planetarium it's like a, it, it basically, it's a simulation. The earth is real, potentially. But when we look into the night sky, what we see is not what is actually there. There is a, like some sort of smoke screen and they are keeping us in the dark, so to speak. That is a cool theory. And it's very reminiscent of the simulation theory which hopefully one day I'll be able to discuss as well. So we're, we're only shown what ETs want us to see. Now this doesn't sound very testable. So it's not very scientific, right? Because you can't trust what you see. Uh, you could say the same thing about like fairies or something, right? So like, 
well, fairies exist, but every time you look at them, they turn invisible. So, like, prove me wrong. <laughs> what are you going to do? You know, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. But this type of technology to be able to do this is not necessarily that far-fetched. And here's why. I just started learning about the Baconstein Bound. Now, I don't know a whole lot about it. But it is basically the maximum amount of information required to perfectly describe a given physical system down to the quantum level. So physical system, it could be anything. It could be an atom. It could be a literally anything. It could be a, something the size of a bus, something the size of a planet, any sort of physical system. How much information can it contain? Basically, how much information can you pack into a certain space? And that's important, right? Because if you're trying to create a simulation where you need to replicate things that intelligent beings like humans are going to test and they're going to look at and they're going to be doing all sorts of things to, to that could potentially like find a hole in the system, they got to simulate or they got to replicate it so perfectly that we cannot tell the difference, right? Uh, so the bacon steam bound. There's this, uh, um, there's this like equation that tells you how much information can be put into a physical system. And it is the amount of information is equal to the mass times the radius times 2.5 times 10 to the 43rd bit per meter per kilogram. Okay, so what does that mean? Basically, a physical system the size of a hydrogen atom can contain one megabit of information. That's a lot. <laughs> Just think about that. That is a lot. Now, that does not necessarily mean that one hydrogen atom actually has one megabit of information. In fact, in nature, I don't know of... I couldn't find any examples of where something, a physical system, actually was like 100% filled with information. There's a lot of empty space. But potentially, it could hold one megabit of information. Okay. Uh, now, let's go up a little bit of a scale because you might not be able to picture a hydrogen atom. 2.6 times 10 to the 42 bits of information to perfectly recreate an average human brain down to the quantum level. Now, that is a... That's crazy. <laughs> that, that's quite a bit of information um, for such a... The human brain isn't like isn't really that big. But yeah, if you wanted to replicate it perfectly, you would need to be able to make that much information. Okay, so we can run simulations, but they're not going to be anything close to what would be required to create uh, the planetarium scenario, right? And just because of the, now we know how much information it would require. Or you have an idea of how much information it would require. So what type of civilization would be able to do this? There is actually something called the Kardashev scale. And this is used all the time when we're talking about theoretical civilizations, right? And basically, there are different levels of technological advancement that a civilization can reach. And depending on what they're called types, right? So type one, type two, type three, there are some subtypes and it's been expanded upon, but for our purposes, we're only going to go over three types of planetary civilizations. So a type one planetary civilization could store all of the energy on their planet. So hundred percent efficient, a type two stellar civilization can utilize all the energy from their sun. Okay, that's pretty <laughs> that's pretty good. Maybe they'll use like a Dyson sphere or something like that. A type 3 galactic civilization can harvest all energy from a galaxy. Holy crap, that that's crazy. So where do we fall on the scale? Uh <laughs> we're not even a type 1. There's a lot of energy on this planet that goes to waste. We're certainly not a type 2. We are type 0. <laughs> but potentially one of these old ancient alien civilizations or the first one could be type three or beyond okay and i read i believe this is in uh 75 answers to the fermi paradox 
th that a type one civilization has enough energy to create a perfect civilization of up to 10,000 kilometers um, of earth to a height of one kilometer. So, I mean, that's a crazy, that's a crazy simulation, but uh, not quite what we would need for the zoo hypothesis. So let's jump to the type three, the galactic civilization, harvest all energy from a galaxy. The, if they were able to do that, they would be able to perfectly, cre they create a perfect simulation with the volume of 100 AU around the earth. And uh, for those that don't know, an AU is an astronomical unit. And basically, it's a distance from the Earth to the Sun. It's just a a unit of um, a unit of measurement for for distance, because you know in astronomy you're de you're dealing with bigger and bigger distances, so they have different units of measurement. So 100 AU around the Earth. Now we're talking. So imagine a bubble around the Earth, perfect simulation of whatever they want us to see. So just. It could just be like taking them out of the picture so we don't see them or traces of them, but we see everything else. I mean, who knows? All this is really hypothetical, but it, it, it's certainly interesting to <laughs> to think about. Like, that's crazy. Uh, but yeah, I could totally see a super ancient civilization doing this, like I said. But it kind of begs the question, why? Why would they do this? So we know that we do this. Um, but uh, like, why would an alien do that? We're kind of assuming that they would think how we do. And, you know, maybe they do. Yeah, I don't think it's too far-fetched to think that. But there are some other ideas that have come out, such as the interdict scenario. And basically, the interdict scenario is aliens... An alien civilization will get so advanced... So imagine, like, Type 3 or beyond where they, like they have every resource they need and everything anything they want they can have truly like god level but the only resource out there that is worth anything to them because they have an abundance of everything else is knowledge and life forms are a source of knowledge what that is cool to think about so an alien can have this, this civilization could get any type of element, any type of whatever. They can have anything, but we know what they can't have. They don't have the knowledge that you have. They don't know what it's like to be you. They know they don't know what it's like to be me. They don't know what it's like to be some alien, like on I don't know, like on some other world. <laughs> they only know what it's like to be them. So perhaps they have quarantined. Um civilizations uh like lesser civilizations like humans and whatnot so that way we evolve and we're collecting knowledge and learning stuff about ourselves because they value that and then eventually once we reach a point where we're like close to them or something then they like assimilate us or whatever and they gather our knowledge because that like knowledge is the most important thing understanding the universe maybe that's the point of life that is a <laughs> that is a cool idea. That kind of made me think, uh, yeah, that's got to be a that's got to be an idea for a for like a sci fi story. Definitely, there has to be. Like, I don't know. That is just so cool to me. Wow, what what an idea. There there are a lot of papers about the zoo hypothesis, and I did not read them all. I read a couple, and I don't think it's necessary to. For, for the purposes of this to dig through and uh, talk about all of this information. I just wanted to give you guys an idea of what the zoo hypothesis was and just that, just like how cool it is. And I kind of wanted to inspire you guys to think about this sort of stuff. And just like uh, uh, John Ball said in his, uh, uh, in his paper in 1973, the, Zoo hypothesis is probably incomplete and it's probably flawed, but it serves an inspiration serves it as, as an inspiration for you know people to to think about and come up with their own ideas and hopefully inspire people to do research and maybe discover something new. And I think that is really important for science is to be inspired. So 
originally I was going to have this episode as um, multiple answers in the uh, the category I was telling you guys about. Um, aliens are here, but they are a secret because we could talk about UFOs and stuff. But I figured that there was enough information with the zoo hypothesis and so much information with the UFOs that you could probably make at least a full episode of each. Or you can make a multiple episodes of each. So I decided to break them up a little bit. And I think it's going to be for the better. You know, I didn't want to have like a multi multiple hour episode. This is much more digestible. And it'll give us some time to think about it between each episode. So hopefully you guys like it. And yeah, I want to thank you guys so much for listening. It really means a lot. And yeah, feel free to leave a comment. Let me know what you guys think. Let me know what you guys want me to talk about. And keep an eye out for future episodes. I will catch you guys next time. I hope you've enjoyed this week's episode. Remember to raise your telescopes and never stop on your quest for knowledge. Except for maybe a drink. This is The Bar at the Edge of the Universe. I've been your host, Adrian Maddox. Thank you, and good night.